So good afternoon. Um, the title of this session is Motivation, Opportunity or Aspiration, or words to that effect. And when I was asked to contribute to this conference, um, all things being equal, diverse and inclusive, I thought what were the challenges and what were the opportunities in this ever fast moving world that is as interactively active and actively interactive, and by that I mean our thumbs are deciding a lot of what happens in this world, and I think we're really underestimating that 140, now 200 plus characters, can actually change the world. Someone has the right to actually challenge how they're being treated in the environment that they're being treated in as a product of that environment. They culturally express a view and then they connect. I have no slides because I want to engage the software between your ears because I don't think we're engaging them anymore. I think we've got these devices, there we go, that do it for us. And if we all use these tools, I'm just wanting to know just how much more we're going to depend on them at the expense of the software between our ears. So 99% of software is between the ears. So I'm going to put mine down. And if they, the battery goes down or you don't have your phone for a day, what feelings do you get? Despair, loss, free, they are wonderful, fantastic. I left my phone at home, I panicked for about an hour, and then something happened. Use your head. <laughs> and then I couldn't find any change to make a call at a telephone box, because they're obsolete. And then I thought, I'll ask someone else to use their mobile phone. And people get quite protective about their mobile phones. <laughs> you tell a lot behind behavioural characteristics, they say, could I use your phone? Because it represents so much of what our lives are about. My work's Life work has been about young people, which I'll talk about, but all things being equal, diverse and inclusive, it is about all things social, cultural and economic. And if we don't work that out, we're not going to understand that by having a good education, from primary through to higher education, further education, whatever that might mean, do you then have a healthy attitude to life? And whatever the challenges are presented, you turn them into opportunities, because the civil society, the social order of society, the self-discipline that you develop in your behavioural characteristics, determine that the community cohesion, whether it's 160 countries that I'm currently responsible to and for, of the students of the University of East London, but more importantly, all underpinned by one thing, vocation, training, employment and entrepreneurship. Five key policy indicators that provide, by way of the racial disparity um, report or audit, if we've got that framework, we stand a chance. Now within that, there's things not so black and white. There's a lot of grey areas. Quite frankly, I don't care what you look like, where you come from, what you believe in or what you sound like, or what your lifestyle choices are. I'd like to know when you come into a common place, are you prepared to accept one simple fact? We all bleed red. Think about it. Blood types might be different, but we all bleed red. That's my philosophy. That's my spirituality. Now on that basis, Everything that we talk about is by way of personal experience. Someone said to me re um, recently, I wouldn't like to meet you on a dark night in a dark alley. And I thought, where's that coming from? Now the fact that I'm a former five times world karate champion could be one <laughs> consideration. The other could be, you wouldn't see me anywhere, I want to hit you so hard, you'd be wondering where it came from from the dark. But it's always about stereotypes. When Alf Garnett died last year, I noted his passing. He was the social commentary of the day. Coon, Nignog, Wog. I say that to my kids now, just look at me from a completely different universe. Did that really wind you up? Yes, it did. Sticks and stones will make, break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, it was the names that started the sticks and stones. The power of the word, what it means, what it relates to. Our politically correct world, Whereas I say the N word, everyone gets really nervous. I say the W word, and people go, what are you talking about? So if I said wigger, would you understand it? Would you get offended by it? If I called you a cracker, would you get offended by it? Well, that's street. But if I say the N word, even if I call it and use it myself, people get very nervous. And isn't it all about people getting really nervous now that we can't have the honest discussion? And why many years, as Simon said earlier, and I've put a full shift in public life, Six Prime Ministers telling the truth to power, and what progress have we made? Very little, but we live in hope. So on the basis of my own journey that suggests, 
If I was the potential bad boy made good, who without sport, and I will throw sport in, and when people tell me why, and the racial um, disparity audit, under culture and community, it had culture, arts, digital, museums. No sport. Anyone watch the World Athletic Championships at the Olympic Park? Just under 200 countries from all over the world, wonderfully rich and diverse. Do you know how many jobs and enterprises supported all of that? My point is made. Their sport, in all its broadest possible social, cultural, and economic impact. Every form, from Paralympics to the full athletics program, everybody providing that faster, higher, stronger. And I believe sport is intrinsically part of the fabric of society and it reflects society. So when I use my four-year cycle of audit of society, it's the Olympic and Paralympic Games. There are some other cycles of the Commonwealth Games, even more pertinent, even more so with Brexit a reality. Are we going to re-engage with our historical notion of empire and colonialism and what that means in 21st century global communities? We are supposed to be. The Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference will be in London next year. Are you aware of it? Do you realise that is one major way of bringing all things equal, diverse and inclusive to the fore? But I'm about young people because I believe they are the challenge and the opportunity. They're the barometer of what we've got right, what we still need to get right and what we might never get right because they might have to get it right for us. Because I'm looking at my pension plan. I'm 60 in February and I'm already going. I need to be really nice to my 24-year-old, my 20-year-old and my, and my 19-year-old. No, 20, 21 and 24. They're a great drain on my resources. So you invest in them in the hope that they will invest in you. My mother says, very wise lady is Violet, still lives in Hackney, 88, and says, why do they have so much children in Africa? I said, it's a pension plan, Mum. And she went, but how? She doesn't get it. But she was a young widow. Father died at seven. Bad things happen. Wolverhampton, get rid of the accent because I couldn't get rid of my colour. So I moved to the east end of London where colour was still a bit of an issue and I got rid of my accent because you, you need to sometimes adapt. And our ability to adapt to this very tricky world of what we look like, where we come from, what we believe in and what we sound like, a word used out of context, arguably not with any angst to it, but can't we just see where it takes us so we can have an honest discussion? Is that not the bedrock of democracy? So East End of London was not a sporting protégé. The National Front, an all-boys school. I needed to defend myself. I sold West Indian patties at school. Budding entrepreneur. Alan Sugar didn't make as much money as me. He was in the same school. It's interesting to know where your path will take you. So I went to a karate club to protect my stock, protect me, and look after my interests. Then I discovered a sporting pathway which is why the diversity of choice suggests you might have to, young people will definitely have to, become more diverse in their skills, their tools, and their adaptability, because they will not have a job for life. It's not going to happen. They're not even going to get a pension, because we're all supposed to invest from one generation to the other. Well, I'm looking for nothing from my lot. So the Jeff Thompson Preservation Investment Plan is to make sure I can keep going long enough to be able to look after myself. We're going to have to work longer so what does that mean for intergenerational working? What does that mean for that all things being social, cultural and economic? Well, I still bark and hark on about sport because that's where I've come from. That's been my life curriculum. That's been my journey. And I am from the School of Hard Knocks, the University of Life, a degree in common sense, something universities might want to introduce, a degree in common sense. <laughs> Employers want resilience. Employers want soft skills. We talk about emotional intelligence. So all this stuff, they take pay for hype, a degree, a great cost now. I take this degree with a CV and they go, that's not what we're after. That's not what we're looking for. We want leaders. We want people who take risks. We want people who push the boundaries. Isn't it interesting how we try that, strike that balance? Well, I've always been a risk taker. The competition karate is the ultimate discipline. Combative chess. You are mentally just deconstructing your opponent. I did much damage without doing much damage. And all Non-contact sports are contact by their very definition. It just allows you to make contact without the rules of making full contact. Discipline. A very important word in that world of all things being politically correct. How many of you feel that political correctness is now a spent force? This is human interaction. If I've engaged your software, you're going to engage with me. I'm going to download a bit more energy. You're not smiling. Oh, there you go. It helps. Oh, by the way, if you don't smile, enjoy this. You're not going to get anywhere. 
It is the ultimate natural high. And on that basis, you stand a chance. Now, everyone says you can be very intimidating, Jeff, so I have to work really hard at my smiling and coping skills because my first instinct is to react. And it's important that we understand what a reaction is and what a response is and how it's measured and how it's considered because we do need to be mindful and respectful of each other. So karate takes me all over the world, travel broadens the mind, Me currency ha medals have currency. You move up the social ladder, you meet some important people. It's always amazing. They want my medals, but they never appear to give me their companies or their government positions. I'm just nice, sporting candy that illuminates. But being the best known unknown has allowed me to tell the truth to power that has transcended from Margaret Thatcher telling me that sport was for the unclean. I challenged her. There were some rights in the 80s, and I was able to articulate and communicate what I felt sport for all should be, which is everything that suggests every citizen intergenerationally with a fundamental human right of sport being part of their physical activity and lifestyle and well-being. Because if we get that right, whether it's classroom, playground beyond the school gate, campus beyond campus, communities, locally, nationally and internationally, inner city, suburban or rural, I believe we can achieve somewhat remotely liking like balance. The world is far too uncertain, the world is far too aggressive, and the world is far too violent. Would you not agree? Last week, two gentlemen on the underground had a difference. They were from two different cultures. Now, I'm sorry, I've, I've had to analyse this, because it told me where we were. And because of their cultures, they'd have gone at one another a little bit more vocally than one might expect. Now, we call it in your face, getting up front and personal. Now, we know that because they gave themselves in. So if they'd been aiming to do anything more, they wouldn't have done. But because the climate of fear and the uncertainty, and because we cannot be diversely comfortable in our skin and our cultures, and a disaffection of society, a young disaffection of society, wants to now do us harm, is that not the barometer and the reflection of just how well we've done as a society? Look at the panic and fear in the season as we approach of goodwill. And it troubled me. It concerned me. Because this subject is almost to the side we've gone back to racial audits. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to be generous. I'm a 20% minority in an 80% majority. So how is it so difficult to assimilate me into society with all the targets that you have? I'm unemployable. How's that? How is that? Come on, we've got all the boxes to tick. So the 20% should be part of the 80%. We should be 100% win-win-win, a cycle of wealth, and everybody's happy. We do ourselves out of a job. Wouldn't that be a nice position to be in? To do ourselves out of a job. Because if you don't give the educational attainment, if you don't give a rich educational opportunity of empowerment, 95% of the racial disparity audit figures that by way of disaffection, since they become antisocial, gang related, and now extreme in their terror, means we either warehouse them in the university of crime rather than the university of life. It has a socioeconomic value for money proposition that we've attempted in policy, but we must now look in hard economics. What does it economically cost us to have this continuing social and cultural shift for all the wrong reasons? That's why I believe young people need to be front and centre of whatever we look at now, because they might coordinate and focus minds. We don't have a youth ministry. The only country in Europe doesn't have a youth ministry. You need to ask yourself why. Because intergenerationally, we can start looking at how we suggest what we were up to. Anyone nick a sweet from Woolworths? Does anyone know what Woolworths represents? <laughs> Doctors and nurses? No? Yeah, see, a little smile. See, everybody would suggest that a generation, millennials, um, my son says he procrastinates, and then he does things at the last minute. That's a millennial. Is that right? What do we do? We think about it, plan it, we process it, we systemize it, we operationalize it, we impact on it, we measure it, and we tick a box. In all of that time, these millennials are turning the world on us. They've created their own paradigm, their own alternative world. And I've watched when they go the alternative way. I've watched the social, cultural deficit and impact when all things fair, just and tolerant are not equal, are not diverse and are not inclusive because they become exclusive. By that very definition that I choose to include you 
is by its very notion, I think, an unwarranted and unfair proposition. Because the class of that benevolence suggests we are not all equal. We're not. When are we going to have the honest discussion? Some are gifted more than others. We need leaders, managers, managers, leaders, but where are the leaders now? Where is the defi decisiveness? Do we leave the company or do we leave the manager? Think about it. Do we know what we need and do we know what we want? Well, this is what I need. That's why I took the role at the University of East London. That's supposed to be my last public appointment after 25 years. And I went, something you can't say no to. I couldn't say no to it. How do you say no to 160 countries? How do you say no to that wonderful wealth of talent and potential? How do you not employ them? So I went to the graduation ceremony. I looked at all these students from all these different countries. By the way, those of you who don't look like me or anyone else of a diversity, you're the minority in Newham. You're a 14% majority. Think about it. But you're not in the jungle. You're not going to get eaten. You will survive. No, but these stereotypes all come into play. He's laughing. He knows what I mean. Not going to bite you. Not going to eat you. Bit of energy. <laughs> bit of angst. Bit of ambition. Bit of hunger. Bit of desire. That's what employers want. Well, that's what the captains of industry tell me they want. Would you turn away a young person who has all those gifts, talents, bit of an edge to them, something you might see in yourself or you might not have seen yourself but now see it now and thought, I'm going to give them a chance? We have to do this because to not do this, we're going to lose. I hate losing. Hated losing. But in sport, I learned everything from losing. But if I said to you, a 14-year-old schoolboy who was shot down on the streets of Moss Side in 1993 at 8.40 in the evening while Manchester were bidding for the Olympic Games, I found that abhorrent. I couldn't believe it. I've been across the world. I've been to Los Angeles. That can't happen. So the motivation is so critical because at a certain time of your life, if you're going to be an, a change agent, you're going to have to take an unpopular decision. You're going to be on your own. People are going to challenge you. They're going to try and derail what you're doing. They're going to try and disrupt what you're doing. And it's going to be a very lonely place. But if you stay true to your values, and if you've been inspired with those values, you will hold firm to those values, and you will see it through. Benji Stanley, you've never heard of. Stephen Lawrence, you will have heard of. James Bulger, you will have heard of. Things happen in threes, ladies and gentlemen. Benji Stanley was not the third name ever mentioned or remembered. That's something I'm addressing now, quarter of a century on. I'm not going to bore you. That's the beauty of the thumbs. The authenticity of my message, what's he talking about? Just Google Youth Charter. And it will take you from tragedy to opportunity. It will take you on what's been realised socially, culturally, economically. From the east end of Manchester and the Commonwealth Games to an Olympic 2012 Games. Legacy, inspiring a generation. Not delivered yet, so that's why I'm here. So we talk about motivation, we talk about opportunity, we talk about aspiration. If we motivate them, if we then provide them with an opportunity to aspire and we deny them that opportunity, that is the worst thing we can ever do. So I actually believe that sport is a vaccine, the arts are an antidote, and culture partially helps treat what we can only treat because to eat, to be involved with cultural activity, any form of heritage, any major events that brings us together can actually bring something that soothes. How many of you have had someone who's inspired you to aspire and people don't understand the difference? My mum, first coach, best coach. My wife, second best coach. My daughter, a nemesis of winding me up. She was my idea, by the way. Be careful about your ideas. You may have to back them up. You may have to deliver on them. I had two males. I was the third male in the pack. I needed parity, so I thought we need a girl. Daddy's girl? Don't know. By the way, she couldn't get me around her little finger. She, she caped, avoided me until the age of three. And then here's how cunning you ladies are. By the way, gentlemen, they have the maturity of that natural ability to manipulate, moan, complain, prod, nurture nature. And by the way, if you don't think that's what's needed, you go to those communities now. We need balance. The city of London want you back because you stop us from taking risks. Too many risks. There needs to be a counterbalance. Then she came up to me at the age of five, gave me the biggest kiss in the world and said, I'm going to need him. And we've been working at it ever since. <laughs> I start with no, default, no. You've got to convince me. But she wants to go to ballet. And she's 
tall and she's athletic, but there weren't many that looked like her. So she had to change that environment. She had to be a trailblazer, but it came with a price. And yes, she's got some life scars, but there's nothing wrong with life scars. It means there's an experience. You can tell a story. So when you look at post-apartheid South Africa, as I had the ability and fortunate experience to do, and the late President Mandela said, I want you to use sport to give me a chance to breathe, to help heal the nation, to help give it hope and opportunity and aspiration. We used it. So when Team GB win their medals, I'm not sure if it's inspired anyone, but I do know this, there are a lot more bikes on our streets. There might be the question of, how do you on the streets afford a bike on the streets that costs so much money on the streets? So they might nick a bike on the streets if they can't earn a bike on the streets. Do you follow my drift? It has to be a cycle of wealth. There has to be a win-win-win for everybody. But life isn't as equal as that. But I can tell you now, if we don't provide that equitably diverse and inclusive opportunity for all, because in a, a three-class system, the gap between haves and have-nots is widening. Young people are not going the traditional routes from education to employability, to a job for life. They believe that if you earn it, they can take it. I'm afraid that's the truth, but how do we find the balance? Well, I believe the East End of London is going to be the ultimate um, experiment, experience and opportunity of how that happens and occurs. Go to Westfields if you want to know what I'm talking about. I, quite frankly, was taken aback at the sheer diversity of cultures that were there Simply one culture, see bag and shop. Airports, supermarkets, well, depending where you want to go. I like Aldi, I like Marks and Spencers, I like Debenhams, I like all of them. But certain people go to certain places because they feel comfortable. It's affordable. And what I'm saying is the comfort of your affordability would suggest every single student that comes to the University of East London, when they graduate, I expect to go straight into a job. Why? Because those companies, public or private, um, third sector, community organisations are looking for that diversity. But we were only finding jobs for up to 60%. Well, I want that near 90%. Because some people won't try. Because what's the secret of success? Hard work. Young people don't want to work hard anymore. They work smart, clever, interactively active. No, because they can. I am so blessed that I had a tough, they said I had a disadvantaged childhood. I had the best possible childhood. And I talk fondly about the National Front. I talk fondly about all those people that gave me a really hard time, but you can when you're six foot five and you've got five world titles, and you're one of the more dangerous human beings really to come to contact with. But I'm not too bad, am I? You, I'm the elephant in the room that's got a tusk and I can make myself known. But what I'm saying is, in all things that we look for, we have to start with ourselves. What was your personal experience? Every one of us has a prejudice, every single one of us. But as long as you don't make it an ist or an ism, we're a work in progress as a species, and we have to really understand that if we're going to make any sense of this uncertain world. So in all of that, when someone said, what does this really look like? We engage young people with sport, art, culture, and digital. We engage them, because that's what they're interested in. We then educate and equip them, classroom, playground, beyond the school gate, informally, formally, with the resilience, life skills, and the potential to be motivated and inspired. Once they're inspired, they have the confidence, trust, and respect that you give them and they give you. It's a two-way relationship. Then thirdly, they will be empowered to either aspire to further higher education, employability, or entrepreneurship. It's very simple. Three phases of engagement. Put a nice framework of matrix, of outputs, targets, outcomes, sustainability, real credible sustainability, and we start to change the world. And I know that everyone's here because they want to change the world. And if they weren't here because they want to change the world, I'm now challenging you. I've downloaded what it is you need to change the world. And if you don't, go to the website, download it, and do some deep meditation. Because it is all between the ears. And we're all making this too difficult. Far too difficult. Far too complicated. So let's get that degree in common sense and that PhD in life. And if you want to do a master's, just work with young people every single day. Because they will frustrate you, they will inspire you, they will challenge you. They'll bring everything out of you. So just so you understand that life's about cycles. One of the people who really inspired me was the great Muhammad Ali. I watched him in 1974, rumble in the jungle, and by then sport stopped the world. 
sort of one of those no high definition televisions because we couldn't, but everybody's around that television. And I watched someone who had something that suggested his gifts and talents whilst he had the power of his ability to win and influence on the basis of a right, a fundamental right, that he believed was part of his belief, he would deny himself of what he loved most, winning and making impactful change. In that negative, he was to visit every campus he would be invited to and sow a seed of inspiration. And as a result, transcend every culture, every background, every belief, every consideration of what they might be. I met him in 1989, 88, the Goodwill Games, 1989. Spiritual experience, an exchange, two heavyweights, world champions. Friends observed what happened, and he downloaded something in me, and he was quite ill then, but he came alive. And just so you understand, an aspirational journey can take you to some quite unusual places. Ten years into the youth charter at the UN, someone who attended the workshop we hosted as a UN NGO, someone from New York, goes to Louisville, Kentucky, runs the Muhammad Ali Institute, sends me an email and says, I'm going to bring some Ali scholars to the Northwest. Well, those words, you said, I want to come and experience them. So they came in 2006. By the time the relationship moves on and Muhammad passes, tragically, last year, a legacy was looked at. But his values underpinned what that legacy would be, the Float Like a Butterfly Social Coach Leadership Program. What is it? Just people who are extraordinary people, who are not lecturers, who are not teachers, who are not mentors. They're just coaches, because we're going to need to coach. Coaching allows you to use different styles. And when I was being coached, there were all these different styles. Then we all had to come together as an all styles. You remember what it was about. Everyone had their style. Everyone has their football club. Everyone has their own way of doing things. But there was a common aim, a common goal. Muhammad Ali's core values are simple. Confidence, conviction, dedication, giving, respect, and spirituality. Is there anyone here who finds any of those six values some that they could not even begin to relate to? Don't worry, a little nod will do, or a smile, I don't know what. Raise your hands, I don't care. What I'm saying is, one or the other, if you don't relate to two or three, you can aspire to them. If you relate to two or aspire or wish another, you can be motivated to. But the opportunity suggests, and I'm telling you now, his legacy will truly transcend. Because every single school or prison, got to prison on December the 12th, Many of them predicted I'd be in prison. Someone even said recently, when there was a gap in my CV, what do you think he was up to then? Did he go to prison? <laughs> they actually said that. I thought, you cheeky little... But I could sort of take the higher ground. They would say, take the higher ground. Where's the higher ground? How high do you go? Where's the glass ceiling? Is it double glazed? I don't know. It is. But does that mean we accept it? Because at the end of the day, it, it will be all about what opportunity, motivation, aspiration provides so that we can simply have the confidence, trust and respect. And then we can start to make a difference. Jeff, you tread on people's toes. I've got size 13 feet. There's a very strong likelihood I will, but I will say sorry. Don't rock the boat. Well, I was told I couldn't swim. You're going. You're laughing and you're going. I'm sorry. I said sorry. She said she was sorry. She apologised. You are forgiven. <laughs> All is well. But what I'm saying is, if you're up the boat, well, I didn't want to fall out of a boat because I was told I couldn't swim because I was black. Then I went to the Caribbean, saw these kids swim, and I went, I can swim. <laughs> I can swim. I never felt so excluded. <laughs> they all look like me. They're all swimming. And I was sat there like this idiot going, shit, I, I can swim. <laughs> I nearly drowned three times thinking that madness as well. But it's amazing when the motivation was there. So the fundamentals have to be there. I believe it's a fundamental human right that these opportunities are provided to enrich and develop well-rounded, resilient 21st century citizens of rights and responsibilities who can find common ground of mutual respect, confidence and trust. Those relationships are fostered, nurtured and worked at. They have to be worked at. Because, you see, if we go from school and it fails and we end up in the University of Crime where we warehouse them, is it any wonder they come out anything remotely other than what they should have been? 
95% of inmates cannot read, cannot write. They could count the money they nicked, but they cannot read and they cannot write. And again, so in, in our programs at Youth Charter, we will use what they're in, we use a soccer ball. And they can subtract, they can add, they can multiply. In Zambia, we went to a school that had nothing. And it's what, 1998, in a UK trade mission visit, and we engaged a village school with all that we had, cones. And what I do, I just need a space. This is all I need to engage and inspire. And punches and kicks are just communicators. They're just tools. But they, were in, they become the wow, the engagement. They come interested. And they say, how about learning about how you read and write and count? Our numeracy and literacy levels in this country for a first world nation is appalling. But you take that confidence away from that errant child. And if you put your hand up in class and got ignored, that's when I became disruptive. The most powerful first step to democracy, the raising of the hand. And I say to most teachers, get rid of your bias, coach. You find everybody with a raised hand, you strategically and tactically make sure you give them, when they raise that hand, that right and opportunity of a response. And when they do something wrong, isn't it strange? We can't make errors, we can't even make mistakes. How are we going to progress? So I consistently look at what management is and leadership is. Two different things. Want and needs, two different things. Have, have not, two different things. Challenges and opportunities, two different things. But what they provide is balance. So all I want to say to you in summary is everything we look at, everything we consider in all things being equal, diverse and inclusive starts with me. As Mohammed said, me, we. Because once you have that currency, you can share that currency and create that cycle of wealth. And that wealth suggests that you don't count the days, make the days count. And by the way, if we don't give back, then why are we here? Giving back is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. By the way, Muhammad Ali is all over me at the moment. I can't escape him. I realise that everything is for a reason. So if you're not sure, or you're unclear, or you don't believe it can happen, because we're a species that have to have something to believe, belong, and identify with, whatever that is. But I, what I want to say to you is, if we don't invest in our future, and those young people are part of that future, where are you hoping to retire? What paradigm world or next planet are you hoping to go to? Because I just simply want to be able to walk the streets and them allow me to do so. Some of them might remember me, get a virtual hologram of me doing things when I was really good at doing it. But what I'm saying is, engage, equip and empower them. Take all that you have and all you're committed to in giving them that motivation of aspiration. And as I've said, every student I met at UEL, I said, I want no more excuses. There is a bar that's been raised. Every single one of you will get a job or will become the new entrepreneurial next best thing. And don't accept when they tell you you can't, you won't, you mustn't, you shouldn't. Why not? Why not? We've forgotten to take well-considered, but at the same time, very, very purposeful risk. We need to take the risk or this agenda will not change. I've downloaded enough. I feel my energy levels are somewhat replenished because I'm quite frankly very tired. It's been a long, demanding year. Every single one of you will admit to that. I've never looked forward to the season of goodwill <laughs> for a long, long time. But what I would say is I can't wait for next year. I cannot wait. Why? We are a species of hope. So thank you for listening. I hope some of it will have resonated, some of it will have been downloaded, and if not, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs>